We can't wait. We've had perfect preparation. We feel like we're perfectly positioned to cause a bit of an upset. Mate, I'm comfortable with the situation. I just need a bit of time with my family at the moment. I think three months is a long time to be hanging out together. You no, know, we're not naive to think that people aren't frustrated about us. I've started to second guess whether footy is my sole future after I finish playing. You don't want to keep having to miss the finals to make you make the finals the next year. Your ticket into the heart of football. Welcome to the Breakfast Club's Inner Sanctum. And it's great to have the champ from the Magpies with us on a Wednesday morning. We love his company, and he is one of the hottest players in the world at the moment. <laughs> the absolute world, Taylor Adams. Good morning to you. Good morning, Half. If you ever want to uh, want to feel good about yourself, oh. just become friends with Half. Exactly. I was just thinking the same thing. What a great hype man you oh, are. You are. You are <laughs> a great a hype man. Hype Thanks, man. mate. Well, you are hot. You're hot to try it. Cheryl, good morning to you, by the way. Good morning. Sorry. Thank you. No, just jumping well, in No there. jumping in. It's your job. It's your job. Just jump in. <laughs> You're, you didn't have 29 disposals on the weekend. You didn't have 13 clearances. You didn't kick a goal of the year that wasn't even nominated. But our man Taylor did. Joey, you would have been hassled willy-nilly at the back when you came in today, Taylor. Because <laughs> Joey has been upset about that for three days. <laughs> the fact that you didn't get a goal of the year nomination. Are you, are you okay with it? Yeah, no. Nah, it's um, It would have been nice, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> because I probably won't ever do that again. But um, no, nah, look, it's uh, water off the duck's back. Pretty, some pretty good goals kicked on the weekend. And um, no, it was obviously Michael Gibbons was out of play, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we nah, go. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, you're not. Gibbo <laughs> was very, very good. He, you know, he probably should have been nominated twice. He was, um, he was outstanding on Thursday night. He wasn't quite good enough to beat you, Blacks, though. You were, you were good. I mean, you were different. Um, we watched that first game in round one, and I thought, oh, I'm not sure about this this Magpies movement situation. I'm not sure what's going on here. But mm. you, how much did you actually have to change and reset for the Carlton game? Because it looked different. Uh, our ball movement, not, not a heap, to be honest. I think the, the round one issue was our contest and pressure around the footy. Um, you know, we were absolutely smacked. Our work rate wasn't anywhere near where it needed to be against the Dogs. Um, they got a really really strong start against us and um, we were sort of chasing our tails for the remainder of the game and you know, as we saw on the weekend they're going to be a, they're going to be a, a good team this year yep. um, and through the midfield there is they run as deep as anyone and um, yeah that was the difference you know our pressure around the football our ability to, to tra- transition from contest to contest as midfielders um, and actually give our forwards a chance to hit the scoreboard which they did you know especially early in the game um, we were able to take marks inside 50 and find some some genuine space so that was a big change. Um, our mindset with ball in hand hasn't changed. Um, our, our, our strategy to move the ball from one end to the other hasn't changed. It was, it was more of a, um, a focus on how we win the ball and, and stop them from bouncing out. That was, uh, was our issue from round one. Why does that work rate become an issue? You mm. say that that was something that you didn't hit hard enough in round one. Is it just a round one thing? Is it just a reminder of how hard you do have to work. What what did you kind of come up with as to why you weren't doing that? Yeah, as soon as I said that, Sherelle, you, you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Dave. Uh, no, I, I don't think it's necessarily. It's just, you know, we um, we sort of found ourselves on the back foot. Maybe we were focusing on other things um, that we thought, you know, may may have been key. But you know, football's football, and, and if you don't get that part of the part of the game right, then it's it's really hard to win the game. Um, and yeah, it's it's a funny way to put it, but you know, it's it's it is a bit of a tactic on how you know teams spread differently from contests. You know, some some teams will leave a midfielder forward of the football. Um, you know, we, we've explored that over the last six months. Um, we probably got it a little bit wrong. You know, our balance was a little bit wrong against Western Bulldogs. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a players aren't willing to work. It was you know maybe we we got a few things wrong um, as players. You know, the the way we reviewed the game was really strong. Um, mm. You know, we saw elements of of Collingwood football in round one, but just clearly not enough. Yeah, and th- is it a mindset thing? Is that kind of what you came back to, or was it literally just a few things that people were in the wrong place at times? Yeah, it's a well, it's a mindset thing in the in the sense that it's it was a bit of a tactic. Um, mm. You know, we probably didn't we we probably didn't dig dig in and um, you know work as hard as we needed to. When things weren't going our way against the dogs, um, mm. you know they just they were they were just able to sort of walk walk all over us. Um, no, for example, we had two guys going at the one one guy with the ball in hand, and they were just able to flip the ball around. So it's, it was just inefficient. Um, it, we were trying, but it was really inefficient. It felt like um, felt like a lot of hard work out there against them, and and on on Thursday night it felt a lot more efficient. Do you not so much take it personally, but do you take it to heart when? 
that is an issue because you're you're almost the captain of that in in the team. When you're playing well and you're the contested ball king, others feed off you. Do you? So when it's sort of an issue for the team, do you take it personally? Yeah, well, I I certainly let myself down um, in round one, and um, obviously had a really strong focus about that being my my bread and butter. Um, so yeah, I was I was pretty keen to rectify that on a Thursday night against Carlton. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a full team thing. You know, if if you've got two or three guys that aren't doing it, it's not noticeable and it makes it really really hard. You know, we're we're a high pressure team. We love mm. contested football. We feed off that. Um, you know, if we don't do that in games, we won't win many games. So, um, as a midfield group, we we certainly spoke about it. You know, getting our balance right and ensuring that we put enough pressure on Colton. Um, you know, to to first and foremost make it really hard for them to move the football um, and and own territory. And and then on the on the flip side, we wanted to work really hard to to open the game up and make the ground really big and and score heavily against them. I know that it's it's a game of football, so you're playing against another team, so you can't control everything. But is there a do you come up with a couple of reasons why some weeks you can be amazing and other weeks you can't? Is it, you know, Cheryl talked about the mindset thing, but can you mm-hmm. sort of determine things that you've isolated even in your own game where you go, well, I didn't do that last week, I've got to do that this week. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, my um. Like my focus is from from round one to round two were uh, my first three or four steps out of a contest. Mm. Um, I focus really heavily on that. Probably I probably neglected it going into round one. Um, you know, coming off that hamstring injury, I was, I was just probably my mindset wasn't um, exactly where it needed to be. I was just really excited to play. Uh, maybe got caught up in the emotion of being back in Melbourne and playing football back in mm. Melbourne. Um, but like you know, like little triggers like that where um, yeah, when I focused on it. Um, against Carlton I felt uh, I think I laid a tackle in the first 35 40 seconds and um, it was from a, a play where I had to spread really hard and um, from that moment on I knew that I was I was sort of back and I felt really good about myself so um, yeah like I said against Western, Western Bulldogs they got to jump on us um, at times it's really hard to claw back when they get momentum and um, yeah they were they were really bullish in the way they went about it they sort of certainly didn't make it easy for us Taylor, is part of it an, an adjustment to some of the new rules? For like, I I look at the new on the mark rule, and that seems like it's it allows that play to flow on a bit more. Is there mm. part of it kind of getting used to that, or do you, or, or how how have you seen that yeah. play out and change things? Well, clearly it's opened the game up a little bit. Um, I, for me, it hasn't. I, I haven't noticed a huge difference. It's probably more so the back half, you know, guys that are playing in defence mm. that that feel the ball coming in a lot quicker, but. Um, for me, football hasn't changed too much. You know, my role is obviously based around contest and pressure, um, and and that hasn't really changed too much. You know, the game has certainly certainly felt a little bit quicker in the first two rounds, but um, yeah, I, I think that if you ask defenders, uh, you, you'd find that they they're the ones that have noticed more of a change. Mm. Can I ask you further about that? Because I've been thinking about you um, on the back of the commentary and conversation around Patrick, Patrick Cripps. Because mm. one of the things suggestions at the moment is because there's less contests, there's less ball ball ups and all that sort of stuff around the ground. That one of his great strengths has been taken away because he is that that bull in those areas. Mm. Is it something that you have haven't done as much work on in the craft of stoppage contest uh, through the summer? Because you might have worked out that it, the game will free up and, and open up a little bit. No. It's um that's still a huge part of what we think is important. Yep. Um, we think that, and I said this on after the game on Thursday night. And contest, you know, people think of contest purely as as stoppage. Yep. But Patrick Cripps is a, a good contest player in front of the ball. Um, you know, he he could be dangerous as a forward. There's contests when you go long down the line, or you have to, you know, there's a high pressure and you've got to get to the next contest where the ball's been bailed out. So, um, that element of the game will never change. You know, getting from contest to contest and, and winning those those fifty fifty balls is um, is going to be you know, a crucial part of winning AFL games until the game ends. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't buy into the commentary about Patrick Cripps. You know, he's obviously he he would have liked to start the season like to have started the season better, but um, yeah, there's there's no way that he's become redundant. He's um 
he'll, he'll, be, he'll bounce back, that's for sure. Well, further to that, what we're doing is throwing out some opportunities for our listeners to get involved and ask some questions this year in the Inner Sanctum. RSN 927, the social media channels, get them in. Uh, Ross asks one around that sort of stuff from your perspective. He, sa- he asks, did Taylor put a greater emphasis on his, his explosiveness and speed over the summer, breaking lines and shooting away from the congested area very well so far? So outside of the Gatorade you've been drinking, <laughs> which you've been drinking a lot of, according to the ads that I see... <laughs> um, <laughs> Is that, is that an area you have sort of worked on? Your explosiveness, your power, your speed, that sort of yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. No, I did, I did, a, um, I did a, um, a speed program with a, a new mob um, based down in Moorabbin called the Speed Project, which a few of, um, a few of the Collingwood mm-hmm. guys got involved in, um, along with a number of other AFL players. Um, and that was sort of based around, yeah, getting out of the, I call it getting out of the hole from, you know, from stoppage or from a stationary position to, you know, getting to max velocity as quickly as possible, um, and being really efficient with that, and that's probably you know in in terms of physical performance, that's where I've got to be really good. I'm never going to be a um, you know an overly quick runner. I don't really hit above thirty thirty one k's an hour on my GPS ever. Where most guys are hitting thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. So um, I'm, I'm yeah, obviously a lot of short, sharp, change direction, yeah. um, repeat efforts, that sort of stuff. Um, yes, yeah, so I spent. You know, probably six weeks doing a lot of work um, based around my technique um, on a running track, and then we transferred it to the gym, and and then obviously to the field. So, um, yeah, shout out to the Speed Project down there who who you know put their hand up and um, helped a lot of us guys out and put a really enjoyable program together. Awesome, that's that's a great insight into what happens away from the club. Do they yeah. have to sign off on that? Does the high performance team at the footy club have to sign off on that? No, uh, not particularly. The the high performance team were across it. Yep. Um, but I think you'll see it more and more, you know, with the the latest start to our pre-season, official pre-season, it, we, we weren't due back until until January. So, um, but most of the guys were, you know, back at the club training or doing their own thing outside of the club, you know, through the middle of December, um, even before that. So, yeah, it's, um, I think that's the way that, that AFL footy will go. Obviously, with the reduced spend in the cap, you know, there's limited resources now. Yep. Um, so players have sort of got to look after themselves to some degree, which I think's which I think's awesome. It means that the guys that are willing to put the work in will, mm. will get the results and yeah. they'll be the good players. Remember when Chris Judd went trampolining or something like that? To <laughs> the Geelong get... boys did that. Remember Chappie Tra- and, and um Chappie. Yeah, a lot of the, yeah, yeah, the a one. lot of the Geelong players Josh, did that. There Josh was Hunt. a gym uh, that they used to go to. I remember going out there and watching them do it. It was like a gymnasium type setup, not the not the basketball one, not the we, basketball one. But heaps, they're all doing all these, yeah, like with gymnasts to get extra, yeah. you know, spring in their step. But I don't remember Chris Judd did that quite late in his career, just to try something different to get an edge. I remember seeing a photo of Chris Judd in a in a ballet outfit. Is that something that rings a bell? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I remember some sort of ballet activities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. James Hurd did that earlier. Hurd was doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, maybe I've confused them too. But yeah, yeah I think you I reckon, might. Have, I reckon no, Johnny did it too. <laughs> yeah, we've had in netball. Stage. We've in netball. We've had uh, ballet people come in to teach you about move your body, how your body moves through the air, and taking that landing. They're amazing athletes. They're ridiculous. Mm. <laughs> No, Incredible. They're, they're officially ridiculous. It's like that Pilates stuff. Have you ever done sort of that hardcore Pilates yes. where you, you move like 44 millimetres yes. for the whole session and you're dripping and you're sweat dead. and your body is in And you can't walk pieces. down the stairs. Yeah. Like it's just yep. a totally different mindset. Awesome. Oh, your body's just doing totally different movements <laughs> and using different muscles that you don't even know you have. And it's brilliant. And it hurts like hell yeah. and you haven't actually done anything. That's quite remarkable. Why do you do it? Well, it's about strengthening your core and all right, that okay. stuff. Yes. Yeah. Rehabilitating through the, the period of time when I was a broken man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay these days, Tate. It's okay. It's okay. Good to hear, mate. Uh, so your your travel plans have changed, or your plans mm. have changed for this week. You were supposed to be off at the Gabba on yeah. Thursday night. You told early in the week, thankfully for for you and for Brisbane, that that game is going to be transferred to Marvel. Does it change anything in your preparation? Obviously, you don't have to travel, so there's, mm. a, there's that. But is anything else in the week change? No, outside of that, not really. No. Um, no, it's obviously it's it's a good result for us, meaning we don't have to jump on a plane. And it was. Um, you know, common sense to, to keep the game out of Brisbane. So, um, yeah, no, nothing really changes. We've got our, our, our what we call pop day today where we go and have a bit of a captain's run and a few meetings and, um, yeah, we, we don't have to board a flight, which is nice. Do you get a bit nervous now that this is this is the first one that's been affected that hmm. after last year and living through last year? Do you get a bit nervous about what might be coming? 
Uh, I'm an optimist half, so I think that the uh, the Queensland government will be all over this, and hopefully we don't see a repeat of you know what happened in Victoria last year. Me too. That's what I think. Just I fingers think crossed. Be, yeah, I think they'll lock yeah. it down. When you say it's good for us, do you prefer not travelling? I, I, I mean, like sleeping in my own bed. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. Because a, a lot of teams and, and athletes like the away trip because it is, just gives you a different environment yeah. and connection with each other, but... Uh, you feel like you have enough oh, of that around the club? Yeah, I, it, it really doesn't bother me. If yeah. we, you know, I, I actually I enjoy travelling, um, but I'm, I'm pretty happy to stay home either. Mm. So it's yeah, it's I'm neither here nor there on it. I think that it was um, as soon as those cases were they sort of come come to light, we you know most most people were pretty sure we'd be playing in Melbourne. Mm. So let's go to tomorrow night because usually well, we always speak to you on a Wednesday. Usually speak, playing footy Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mm. but you're playing tomorrow night. So you're a day out from the game. I'm interested in what you eat tonight and yeah. when you start. Just you know what time you go to bed um, to give yourself the best chance to be ready on game day. And just just that last sort of 24 hours before the game for people out there. Yeah, I'm pretty relaxed. Um, my I used to be really um, everything that I did was really structured. And I've sort of changed that mindset, um, you know, for the the fact that if something does go wrong, you're you're not chasing your tail. You mm. feel comfortable with just everything that's happened. Um, my my the way I see preparation is most of it happens, you know, ninety five percent of it happens in the front half of the week, where you get to actually go out in the field and train and you know put the time and effort in there. And then the last forty eight hours is you know sort of all about recovering, making sure that your body's fresh um you know you're hydrated you, you're well fed and you're ready to go so i've got a few few guys coming over for dinner tonight um some of the younger boys um cooking a spaghetti bolognese whitey and i'll probably be asleep by about 9 30. So have you got a amount of hours you like to get sleep wise like half and i get about sort of three or four and yeah all. but <laughs> i mean have nah, if you got like a, an app or something like that that you charted or is there a, a, an optimum level of, of how much sleep not really you I, again i used to use a um a sleep tracker um but i found that i woke up some some mornings and felt really good and my sleep tracker would tell me that i slept poorly so i listened to a, a podcast not long ago and um Basically, the the crux of it was if you feel like you've it was a sleep podcast. If you feel like you've slept well, you probably have. And if you feel like you've slept poorly, you probably have. Yeah. So, I um, <laughs> it's pretty yeah, basic, yeah, it makes it? sense, doesn't it? But um, yeah, any anywhere above eight hours, I'm pretty happy. I'm, I'm up early in the mornings, um, and then I'll have a nap tomorrow to to sort of kill some time. Um, absolutely love playing at nights because you get a, a chance to do a few things where. You know, throughout the day, I'll have the house to myself and I'll be able to do some study and um, clean the house and just chill out and then gear up and ready to get ready to go. Cause it, sorry, is that hard playing at night? Because people that are listening to this, they might play in their social basketball team yeah. at night where they spend a whole day at work and then the 10.30 game. The 10.30 game is a disaster. Yeah. Oh, they disaster. But, that they, but they don't they that even think news. about <laughs> what they're doing that night until they're driving to the game. Yeah. Um, but to actually spend the whole day... Mm. waiting to play at night How, is it just about keeping yourself busy yeah. to not think about it Do maybe some of the younger players play the game before they've played it I can't imagine that would be easy waiting all day to play yeah I think it can be emotionally exhausting at times if you if you don't know exactly how to approach it um you know obviously I'm a little bit more experienced than I used to be so yeah I um I've found things that work for me. I, I get a lot of uni done on my, the day of a game um, for when we play at night and also find myself just doing odd jobs around the house. So um, keep myself relatively busy. It's, um, yeah, no doubt in my, you know, the early days of my career, I used to, you know, sort of think about the game a lot and get almost hyped up before I needed to. Um, now I'm relatively relaxed until I get to get to the club and then start walking over and it's it's not until I'm around my teammates that I feel really excited about the game and um, yeah I feel like I start to you know amp up a little bit I went the opposite way in my career where I got more and more things in my mm. routine that I needed to do and it was not good yeah. it's not yes. because then if something Here didn't happen, if I accidentally put my left sock on before my <laughs> right sock no it was the other way around um, so, <laughs> um, I'm going to play Paulie today oh, ah, no, I even start. Bloody hell. there's a wrinkle in my tape um, <laughs> but so is that an intentional thing for you did you feel the weight of some of those things on you yeah I did yeah absolutely um, oh I got to a I got to a stage where 
like with my kicking, I would spend, I'd have to have on my day off, I'd have to have, you know, an extra 70 kicks. Mm. And I'd have to fi- finish on like 10 good kicks. Yeah. Um, you know, stuff like that where I, yeah. you know, just got to a point where it was exhausting. Um, and I started to not enjoy what I was doing. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I took a, sort of t- took a step back. Um, you'll f- yeah, if you ever see me train, you'll just see that I'm, I'm just having fun out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm working hard and, um, I probably I probably used to be almost too, like too focused on uh, on the training track yep. where it was like I was just completely out of the zone. Now I feel like every time I go on the training track, I just hit this sweet spot where I'm I'm having fun with my teammates. Um, you know, whatever happens happens, and I've got focuses and that sort of thing. But um, it's more about enjoying it and mm. yeah, not taking anything too seriously. Mm. This is interesting, this conversation, because we had a conversation last week, Whitey, with someone in the sanctum. I've been racking my brains for minutes trying to work out who it was, who has got to the point also where they're not as intense mm. with their preparation. Oh, that's Isaac, probably. Tom Mitchell. Tom, it, was. It, was it was Tom, Tom Mitchell. Mitchell. It was. It was Tom Mitchell, Brownlow yeah. medalist. And he's similar to you. He used to be really frantic about things and really meticulous with his preparation, but he's backed off that now. Mm. So I'm wondering, now that you've said that, I'm starting to think, why? what's the trigger for this? Is it what you've been through the last couple of years as experience? Is it why are we getting to this point where you you are the cream of the crop? I mean, talk about midfielders in the comp. You and, and Tom Mitchell were talking the best of the best. And you've got to a point where it's you've that manic focus has been shifted aside. I'm wondering why that's happening. Yeah, it's probably it's been a work in progress over the last three or four years. Um, I don't know. I think I, I just found that it worked for me emotionally and mentally, where I was able to. I've got other things in my life that I put time and energy energy into. Um, and it's not not it's not about you know you know making football seem less significant, which you know winning is absolutely everything to me. I like absolutely you know, you know it's that's what that's what we're paid to do. Um, and everything I do does, at the end of the day, is to try to win games of football. Um, but it's about finding what's most effective for for each individual. And um, I was finding that I was just I was getting to games, and I was sometimes exhausted. Um, you know, I maybe overtrained at times. Certainly mentally overtrained, where I was you know putting too much thought into what I was doing, and um, it, it became a thing that was ineffective for me. And um, yeah, I've, you know, once once I made a few changes and you know, it didn't happen overnight, I made a few changes and sort of started to see some results and felt better whilst I was playing. Um, I guess that's, the, you know, the, the more I've gone in that direction. More questions from our listeners coming through uh, in the last 24 hours. This is from Matt. Uh, are the expectations from Collingwood fans, I reckon that's interesting, by the way, uh, on Willa Hoskin Elliott and Josh Thomas too high? Are they playing different forward roles in than 2018? Asks Matt off the SMS. Yeah, they are. Um a forward structure has ch- footy's changed quite a bit from from 2018. Um, teams are defending much much better, um, and our forward structure has changed. So you know their their impact. You know Will Hoskin Elliott did some really nice things last week. Mm. Took some big marks and um, Joshy Thomas actually. You know I think he had 11 touches. But after the game, I was actually walking off with him. I said, "Geez, you had a good game tonight," and he's like, "Yeah, I just." He goes, "Yeah, I, I felt like I had an impact, but you know again didn't hit the scoreboard or." didn't touch the footy a lot and you know he was pumped up in our team review about being in the right position every single time so they were able to to do what we did in offense um and as i said before you know it's about and and richmond do it better than anyone if you see watch their forwards from behind the goals they are they're almost in the first row of the grandstand they open up so much space for the corridor of the ground that um it's almost impossible to, to defend so mm. You know that that role, um, that that third tall and those higher half forward roles can be um, really thankless at times and underappreciated, but, um, probably externally. But you know we see them as vital vital roles um, in our football side, and and they're pa- playing them really well. It's almost getting like NFL where a Josh Thomas, we'll just use him as an example. It's it's his running patterns that are creating space for mm. the set play for someone else. Mm. And you know you see that often in NFL where they're in the offense, but they might not touch the ball, or they might touch it two or three, catch it two or three times. But it's the running patterns that created the space for the others with all the strategy doing that. You don't know as a fan watching it. Yeah. I think it's getting a bit like that with footy yeah, as well. Yeah, it is, and you know the better we get with ball in hand, the more you know a player like Josh Thomas will get his get his lick of the ice cream. You know he was missed three or four times. To, you know in in places where. 
he could have been used and, and could have had an impact on the scoreboard. So, um, yeah, at, at times a really thank, thankless role from um, you know, external audiences, but inside the four walls of our club, we, we highlight those things. Taylor, how many times have you had an interaction with the opposition coach at a quarter yes. time break? Good question. Uh, no, nah, never. Never? I don't think. I don't think. Yeah. Um, no, what, what did you think about the uh, situation with Chris Scott and how that's all played out out, out yeah. on the field? Um, I don't know. It's, you know, without knowing any of the details, you know, I'm sort of speculating. Um, you know, being a, being a, a head coach, you, you certainly feel like you're a part of the team. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm neither here nor there on it. I'd, I'd have to get more detail to actually make a informed comment, but um, it's a heated game football. You know, there's you know there was a um, an incident that happened on the football field where you know Gary Rowan's obviously cop two weeks, and I think rightfully so. Then that sort of action we need to need to try to mm. eradicate. Um, and you know, it's it, they're two really proud footy clubs. Um, it was a big game, so you know both hadn't hadn't didn't win in round one, and they wanted to get the four points. So um, yeah, as I said, un- until I had all the details, it's impossible to make mm. an informed comment. And this is from Sarah, the last one from our listeners uh, at RSN 927 on the socials with our, our Inner Sanctum guests. Has Darcy Moore surprised you with what he's been able to do? Has he reached his potential yet or is there more to come, <laughs> asked Sarah, because he's been something else. Yeah, he's been he's been exceptional. Um, surprised me, no. No, he's he's always been trending in, in that direction, even, you know, for three or four years where um, he's still a young man. He's like 25. Mm. Um, you know, obviously an incredible athlete. Um, but the the way that he's, you know, the way that he's, um, I guess, leading that back line um, and his his awareness of his opponent and where the ball's going to go and and then his ability as a, as an athlete to go and win the footy is it's the best in the comp at the moment. Um, and he had a great year last year, but he certainly started this year, you know, better. Um, and yeah, you know, his ball ball use has been exceptional. His ability to turn defense into offense, like you know, instantly is as good as anyone that I've seen. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I expect him to get better. Well, it's going to be a big night tomorrow night at Marvel Stadium, Collingwood and Brisbane. Uh, are you thinking about getting yourself a Trey Rusco-style haircut? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Hey, we we Not should quite. ask... We should... <laughs> I don't think Not anyone fun. should really be going down that path. Um, what, one final one, because to sort of to sort of complete the full circle with Adam Trelaw. So we talked about mm. what you might say to him, what you might do going to the first <laughs> contest, all that sort of thing. As it played out, yeah. how did it go? Was it weird? Because there's one point where you were almost giving him a, a cuddle in the right forward pocket there at one point down at the <laughs> yeah. city end. No, it wasn't. It wasn't, wasn't weird. It was no, nah, just felt felt normal. Um, you know, we had a job to do, and when you're out in the footy field, you there's so many things going on that you you're trying to comprehend everything. And um, you know, we were we were sort of chasing our tails a little bit. So um, there was a we were focusing more on ourselves and on what Adzi was doing. Um, end of the day, at the last laugh, they got the chockies, and he played pretty well, and he played well on the weekend. So. Um, yeah, no, that was just another game of football. And got a cheer from the Pies fans in the end. Yeah, in the end, once we uh, once I knew we couldn't win the game, <laughs> <laughs> they just relaxed off a right, bit. I reckon that's right. a bit. I reckon that's right. There's a text here to to finish this off, uh, Daniel. Taylor seems like a young, articulate man. What cruel twist of fate sent him to Collingwood? <laughs> Can he sue anyone? <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the that's the dismount oh. from Magooly. Thank you, Magooly. <laughs> uh, that's very funny. Oh, that's very good. You chose to go to Collingwood. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yes. I was I was unarticulate back then. <laughs> Well, you're not. You're fantastic. You're a part of our world. We love it. And you're a hot to trot at the moment. Can't wait to see you in action tomorrow night. 7.40, check your local guides against the Brisbane Lions. Thank you, Patel. Thank you. Thanks nice for having me. See. Nice to see you as always.